Hello and welcome to Listen Able. It is our podcast uh, where Dylan Orcott and I share a studio with some incredible people and today is no different. Um, we'd like to introduce Prue. Yeah, look, I met Prue not too long ago. I was lucky enough to do a speaking gig on International Day of Disability and I like to think of myself as the best speaker on a panel and guess what? I was not because <laughs> Prue was there. Prue was so impressive and we really appreciate you giving up your time <clears throat> to come in here today, Prue. So thank you. So can you please introduce to us who you are and what you do? Well, my name's Prue and I am an artist and I'm also third Dan black belt in Taekwondo, <laughs> but I've stopped that now okay. and I'm starting tap dancing. So I'm going to start working my way towards being a triple threat. I like it. <laughs> Perfect. Just like Shirley Temple, my biggest role model. Great. And so I've got the dancing. I'm in a theatre group called Raucous. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually, we, we rehearse in at the South Melbourne Community Centre. And also I'm in a band called Ice Cream in a Mug. <laughs> <laughs> and we sing songs about happy hope and food. Brilliant. Ang Angus, I told you. Oh, yeah, this she is already got firing. All the skills. And, Prue, what is your disability? Well, I actually don't identify as having a disability. I identify with identity first language. So I'm an autistic person. Very good. Nice. So, what is that? For everybody that doesn't know, what, is, what does that mean, identifying um, language? Well, the thing is that. We started in the disability community. Our history starts with medical language and that, um, s that says disabled person. So it's the medical language first and that the person themselves are disabled. And then came along the disability social model and the social model of disability uses person first language. So person who's a wheelchair user, person with Down syndrome and around the 70s, I think, the deaf community um, made a stance and started using identity first language. So person first language is like, it's not the person that's disabled, it's society, the way that we've designed society that's disabling. And um, an example for the autistic community is bathrooms having Dyson hand dryers. So a lot of the autistic community actually use the accessible toilets because it's in an environment they can control. Mm, yeah. um, because otherwise I need to pee with my ears blocked. Mm. It's, you... it's pretty full on. That's... It's like our kryptonite. It's really, <laughs> really hurts. Wow. Um, a lot of autistic people like open the door slightly and check to see if there are Dyson hand dryers and if they see them, then they run and use the accessible toilet. Because the noise is too much? Yeah, because our sensors are connected with our fight, flight, fright reflex, it means at any time, I mean, depending on your sensory profile, everybody's got their own individual sensory profile. Mine is actually very hypersensitive to sound and smell. So my brain, the way that it processes that information is that it processes it too much and my brain doesn't have enough time to process the information so it becomes painful and it can make my brain shut down. Wow. But then I have other um, senses like my vestibular sense which is my sense of balance in my inner ear and my brain doesn't get enough information um, so I seek that sense. Mm -hmm. So I love jumping up and down, spinning around and uh, that kind of thing. And I'm always moving. I love moving. Um, but yes, back to identity first language. Uh, it doesn't really make sense to me that um, I would be a person with autism because it sounds a bit like I have a cold and I'm going to get over it one day. <laughs> and that's not going to happen. Nah. Um, whereas being an autistic person, like it's my brain. You know that it's my brain and it's who I am. And if you took the autism away from me, I'd be a completely different person. So I, um, I strongly identify with identity first language. Love that. And also a lot of my community does too, because Amaze, I work for Amaze as an autistic consultant. And we, what, what do Amaze do if people don't know? We're a um, 
non-for-profit organisation that advocates for the autistic community and we have a phone line that people can call up. We just got the national bid, so it's going to go across the whole of Australia that anyone can call and ask any question they want about autism, uh, about NDIS, which is a big struggle for our community to get access to that, about education. Um, and yeah, I work in the capacity building section so I of the business, so I... Um, I mean, organisation. Mm. I get those words confused. <laughs> um, but yeah, I work in that part. So it means I'm out meeting clients, training them in autism, positive behaviour support and doing environmental audits. I actually did one last year or the year before. I think it was last year at Northland. Cool. Because they're the first... Um, they're the first shopping centre in the world to have a quiet room and they wanted to have Target open up to uh, about a month before Christmas shopping mm -hmm. so that the autistic community could access that for their Christmas shopping. Oh, and uh, they, have, they have some shiny floors. <laughs> I walked in there because usually like my grandma, she really struggles in shopping centres because she has glaucoma. Mm. So she gets uh, really... Uh, loses her confidence when it's a really shiny floor because she might fall over. And so um, usually shopping centres are quite shiny. They polish the floors, but Target was next level shiny. Almost like see your reflection shiny. Yeah, it was. <laughs> and including the fluorescent lights, oh, which yeah. are so bright. So yeah, when I walked in, it actually looked like a six metre swimming pool. And I said, I don't think this is going to work. <laughs> um, and my colleague Fiona said, actually, dogs will really struggle. Guide dogs will really struggle in this environment because they don't have very good depth perception. Oh, they don't know where they're going. Yeah. But a good thing was that they had shiny corridors. However, where their aisles were, they had different flooring, like timber flooring. Mm -hmm. And so it meant that to to work out if you're in an aisle and you're getting sensory overload or having a meltdown, you can easily see where where to go to exit the store and they're hanging stuff all on the ceiling so I could actually navigate just through um, all the things they hang on the yeah. ceiling. Cool. Wow. Now, for people that don't know, you when you and I hung out last time, you explained what it's like having autism so well. Can you give people that don't have much of a knowledge around what um, life with autism is like, can you just give like a brief kind of definition or how, uh, how, you, how do you explain it? Uh, autism is basically a different processing journey and it's a much longer, highly detailed processing journey because um, I did look at one study that uh, happened in America uh, of a neuroscientist and he said that the autistic brain develops 67% more neurons than the average brain in the second and third trimester of pregnancy. And at the age of two, we all have the most neurons we'll ever have, everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and after that, we do a thing called neural pruning. So it's like we've got all our neurons and they're connecting and that's making neural pathways. And the way that we think, it's kind of like muscle memory with sport, but it's through thinking patterns. And um, the thing is that at certain ages, developmental markers, which is where autistic people get picked up um, because we're not hitting those typical, those average developmental markers, um, basically certain ages we do what's called neural pruning. So the neural pathways are branching off, you know, they're growing like a bush and bushes grow in different, at different rates. One branch will be really long, another one will be shorter. And then at ages like probably 5, 7 or 8, 13, uh, 16, that um, gets pruned off at all at the same level and then it starts growing again. And autistic brains don't do that as much. So we already start with a lot more neural pathways, but then we keep having we're consistently got more throughout our lives. And um, like at the moment, I've been having an autistic burnout. I've been on and off for about two years. Not many people know or recognize autistic burnout, 
but it's basically like a burnout but you're autistic and it's really full on and because a lot of autistic people are very connected with their brains for me I've been having four different sensations from my brain and I can actually feel what part of my brain is tired and mm. it's particularly my prefrontal cortex at the moment which How is How do you feel that? Mm. Um well I have like throbbing pain in the front part of my brain and behind my eyes and that um makes me really tired and because the prefrontal cortex is where we have our executive functioning skills our rational thought um making priorities sequencing steps all that sort of thing it means that um I'm really struggling with those skills things like keeping my room clean I need a lot of support with that I, I also need a lot of support with that yeah I'm, but I'm very bad at I'm that really also. lucky that my partner Teddy made me a step-by-step -step structure on how to keep my room clean so I can just check it off each time I do a job and then it's not like a lot of information yeah. it's just step by step doing cool. that you've um well, we've got a bit of a prop in the studio as well Prue you are still in ahead of time to bring in essentially a glass jar which is here and also some dollar coins now what's the reasoning what's the process what are we about to do what's the what's what are we what's happening here Dylan uses a lot of high level and figurative language okay and so what, what does that mean? So high level and figurative language is like sarcasm, idioms, um, old sayings. So it's things like, um, oh, I remember when I was a kid and I was in the car with my parents and brother and it was raining really, really heavily. And my mum said, oh, it's raining cats and dogs. <laughs> and I looked out the window and I really wanted a dog. Like I still really want a dog. <laughs> Luckily I'm getting one next year. <laughs> okay. But um, I went out, I looked out and said, where's the dog? And I got my heart broken because it was just the rain pouring down. So you miss some sarcasm in conversation. So you take things more literally. Yeah, I take things literally. <laughs> right. But also like a lot of it... Um, with sarcasm, it's a tone of voice. It, I, I actually class sarcasm with lying, lying, white lying, and sarcasm all sit, they're all cousins. Okay. And I actually have a story about that. Do you want to hear it? Of course. It's what we're here. Okay. Well, basically, um, I'm on the disability support pension and I, when I was younger, I had about four different jobs and one of them was drawing portraits at a retirement home. And so I went to, I, I was getting, I think paid $50 in cash a fortnight and dad said, oh, it doesn't matter. I don't want to report it. It's not that much money. It's not a big deal. I can't be bothered putting that there. I said, no, we have to do it. And so dad tried to start coaching me how to white lie. Oh, to be able to keep your pension. <laughs> Over a few months, just so he didn't have to tell Centrelink that I was earning $50 yeah, in yeah. cash a fortnight. Because if uh, Angus, is, I was on the disability pension too. If you earn money, it comes off your pension. Uh, you can't, it, it, okay. it gets negative effect. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so basically, um, my dad didn't want to report it. I wanted to report it, but dad does all the paperwork for me. I can't access services like that without my dad. It's too much information, mm -hmm. too much paperwork. But anyway... I, um, dad over a few months, uh, like weeks or months tried to coach me how to white lie. So we got into the Centrelink office. They asked me what I do for work. I said, I got this job and this job and this job and I get paid $50 in cash and for like, your retirement. Oh no. And like, then no. I went, oh, whoops. <laughs> I wasn't supposed to tell you oh that. No. I was supposed to lie. <laughs> and then I looked at my dad and he did his nervous laugh. <laughs> But then I, then the Centrelink people said, oh, that's okay. We don't need to put that on the books. There you go. Oh, and so pays to be truthful. I taught my dad that day that charm over white lies. I okay. like that. It works. Mm -hmm. So every time we say something that is hard for you to process, we have to put a dollar into our pot. Does that work for you? And it's we're gonna more like every time you use 
um, language where you're not saying what you're meaning and meaning Correct. what you're saying. So okay. I, I already then I'll do my best to pick you up. Maybe Teddy can be my indicator too. Good. Yeah. I owe you two dollars <laughs> already. Studio. Okay, because oh, when really? we talked the other day okay. before coming on this podcast, it was quite a hot day, and I said, "Are you cool when you come in if we film the podcast?" And Prue said, "No, I'm not cool. I'm hot." <laughs> gotcha. So, so one. I also said this. Okay. When you get downstairs, give me your bell and I will come down and get you. And she goes, I don't have a bell to give you, but I can call you. There you go. So we are officially at $2. Aren't people who are watching this on Very YouTube good. or online, they will be able to see our bowl, but we will keep us truthful. So Teddy, your partner is in the studio. Like he can indicate if maybe something goes over our head. Yeah. Over my head. Okay. As in, it's literally not going to go over your head, is it's it? It's not going to go over your <laughs> head. How good is this? <laughs> okay, great. So right, we're away. It's great. It's a great way to kind of... I didn't even pick that one up. There you oh. go. So it's a great way to, I guess, understand a bit better what it's like for you to, you know, live with autism. How did you go growing up? How, what was your childhood like? How did other kids and other people that you met treat you? Um, well, I got bullied at school a lot. So did I. And um, I used to get cornered a lot and they call me Pooh. And that was, I used to say to my mum, why did you call me Pooh? This is just too hard. I really, and my parents would say, don't worry. Just like Winnie the Pooh the bear. And I was like, but it's a silent H. <laughs> it's, you don't get it. You've forgotten what it's like to be a kid. Um, so you were bullied at school. Were you bullied based around... Uh, Having autism specifically or just kids being kids? Well, when I was a kid, nobody knew what autism was. Mm -hmm. And when I went to my first primary school, I wasn't diagnosed with autism. Right. I was, I actually, when I was seven, I got misdiagnosed with ADHD and put on Ritalin and got really bad side effects mm. for a very long time. The kids would, I, I think they were bullying me. I probably wasn't picking up the social cues. And I was just an easy target, mm. um, you know, a fun game. And I used to get cornered against a wall and get yelled at. And I didn't have the skills to be able to get out of that situation. And I would get my fight, flight, fright reflex up. So I would hit and kick them and run away. And I, including doing that to teachers, because back then teachers were allowed to touch students. Mm. So I... Um, did have the principal grab me one time and I bit her finger. And that was when I got expelled from that school, <laughs> um, amongst doing a few other things. <laughs> naughty things. Yeah, but I was always the naughty kid, not because I wanted to be. I went to a disabled school after that in Q, and um, that was really good respite. There were between 25 and 31 students there. However... Um, with that process, I in that time that I was there, I got diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome and that was explained to my parents like I have an illness that I'll never get over. Um, you know, it was very negative and um, my parents really didn't want me to have a disability. They saw that, you know, I'm highly verbal. I, um, you know, I can do things that don't fit the stereotype of autism. I'm actually the furthest away you can get from those stereotypes. What are some of the misconceptions or stereotypes that people put on people with autism that aren't true? Well, it really comes from the beginnings of the research with autism, which started in the early forties. There was one guy named, uh, what was his name? Uh, I think, why have I got the name Eric Clapton in my head? It's totally different. It's not Eric Clapton. So it was at the start and there was Hans Asperger and there was Leo Kanner. That was got his it. name. Nice. So Leo Kanner was in America. Hans Asperger was in Germany. Um, there was stuff happening with the Nazis. So his work was never translated until about the 80s or 90s. Um, whereas Leo Kanner, his, his work was already in English, so it was very accessible. The etymology of autism, the very beginnings of that word means selfism. So already you can see the links with schizophrenia there, which, um, from the eighties and before 
a lot of autistic people were misdiagnosed with schizophrenia, put in institutions, um, put, uh, and that's like probably people aged around 50 and older in our community. Um, and basically those stereotypes come from the, those two uh, research bases from the 40s. So Leo Kanna was very selective in the way that he was looking at what autism is. Um, I think he, uh, no, he didn't coin autism. I think that autism was coined in the turn of the century. Mm. But he basically said that an autistic person is a, a boy who is uh, not aware of his surroundings, not com uh, not interacting with his environment, he's doing repetitive behaviours and he's not intelligent. Um, Hans Asperger, he was looking at the what a lot of people call the other end of the spectrum and he was looking at young boys who he would call his little professors. So already there's a gender stereotype, mm. um, but also... Uh, his little professors were people that young people who were um, not very good at social communication. However, they knew an extensive amount of information about one particular topic of their interest and that um, they could be, you know, four years old and standing up in a university and giving a lecture to a bunch of adults about that interest. Um, so when uh, Hans Asperger's work was translated into English around the late 80s, early 90s, that's when the idea of the spectrum came up. Mm -hmm. And the spectrum was basically like a lot of people thought of it as low-functioning autism and high-functioning autism, and there's a line connecting them, and you can move along the spectrum. And this is also when they didn't believe that they're autistic adults, that we grew out of our autism. Mm. And um, so there's no sort of kind of resources for autistic adults. One, And it's still, it's getting better now, but there's still quite a gap between uh, once you finish being a, a kind of 21, then you just fall off and there's not much support there um, to get into the work force but uh also um with the spectrum the way that i was explained the spectrum was that um that i am asperger syndrome is like high functioning autism and so there's like autism on one end of the spectrum and there's neurotypical on the other end of the spectrum and the harder i work to get my skills to um, be, be neurotypical or be like an average person um, accessing society, the, the um, more rewards I would get. The, the closer I got to autism, the more punished I got. Mm. So, um, you know, by the education system, mm. by my parents who didn't have any education around that, no support um and by my peer group so I, I actually didn't really have any friends until um until much later in life how did that make you feel growing up with well not, with it was my friends. biggest goal my biggest goal was making new friends that's, awesome. that's really what I wanted that was like if if you know I mean I don't like using the term special interest because I think it's still very stereotyped but if I had a special interest as a young person, it would be making new friends. And so that meant that with those two things coupled, it meant that I got ex exceptionally good at passing for a neurotypical or masking my autism. So I would use all of my capacity just to put up filters to behave mm. the way that I was expected to behave. And of course, instead of that capacity going towards me getting educated, it went towards me making friends wow. and fitting into society. And that's very common for a lot of autistic people. Now we don't use the term high and low functioning because it is very harmful language. Um, you know, it, it means that I might be seen as high functioning now, 
but then I go home and I'm exhausted and I have a meltdown, my brain shuts down, that I will be low functioning and that is uh, not valid. That is, um, you know, harmful to others around me and it's not, do it's not practical. So um, a lot of guilt comes from me uh, having my brain shut down and it's taken many years to kind of take these, um, learn to take these filters off, mm -hmm. but also, and, and re- kind of learn how to be autistic, which is much better for my mental health. Okay. It sucks. You have to pretend that you're not the person yeah. that you are. You the know. word masking really sucks yeah. to hear, you know, the feeling that you have to mask, not because of who you want to be, but because of who society, um, you know, and other people desert, you know, determine well, that you should be. The thing is that when society was really getting designed the way it's designed today, we were all in institutions. Yeah. So we didn't get to participate in that design. Um, which now we're starting to, you know, get our voices and um, be heard, be listened to, and that's really exciting. But there are a lot of people who, you know, like you look at Dylan and I and we're white Australians and our families are fairly well off, you know, well off enough to support us and, um, and that there are a lot of families out there, people that have multiple disabilities and their families don't, their, their second language is English or they don't speak English and they are not, like if we're not getting the support, our family is not getting the support, then you can imagine mm. all these other people that are just finding all of those loopholes mm. and yeah. falling down. 1.3 billion people <laughs> around the world and... You're so true. We're lucky we're born where we are, aren't we? Because our lives would be very different. And you made some friends and you made a special friend as well. Uh, you've got your partner, Teddy. How did you guys meet? Uh, on a rainy Tuesday night at the Coburg Castle and a uh, share house in Coburg about... Teddy? Uh, eight and a half years ago now. Oh, eight wow. Eight and a half years ago. Yeah. Did you think when you were growing up, you struggled to have friends? Did you ever think you weren't potentially going to find someone to have a relationship with? Uh, well, my, my goal has not really been strongly in finding a partner. Um, it's really been making friends. You've been together eight and a half years. Would you want to get married one day? No, I'm not that silly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there a reason why? Is it the well, construct of marriage? There is, or is... one thing. Mm -hmm. If I probably got married to Teddy, I would not have my DSP anymore, oh. most likely. Ah, uh, right. Disability support. Pension, yeah. Yeah. So um, there's one reason. So it's all about the cash. It's not all about the <laughs> cash. It's just that, you know, I really depend on that support. I would not be able to do what I do without that support. And I, my, you know, the second goal, one, first one, making friends, second one, being independent. And, and I am very hungry for my independence and always have been. Um, and I, particularly around the age of 15, 16, I really realized that um, I was very dependent on my parents and, and that's not what I wanted. I want to be an independent person, being part of society, giving back to society. But the fact is that I got expelled twice and suspended seven times. I wasn't educated. I couldn't, I couldn't access the things that other people can. And I need that support from my family. Um, so I also need that government support while I kind of, with my, you know, brain, because it's highly detailed, it's much slower. It's like if we were to go from here to Flinders Street, you would probably go via tram stops and I would go via buildings uh, in the same speed of time with the same, with the expectation of your speed of time. So it's really um, that I need more time to be able to do things like I just got my master's in fine art and that's really cool. Mm -hmm. I learned so much and now I can um, go and be an artist and, and put that in other places and artists mm -hmm. can make money. There is a misconception we can't, but we can. Um, and, uh, you know, being an autistic consultant as well with a maze. And I couldn't do those things now without being able to be autistic at work. 
uh, that's a really great thing that I can do. And being autistic at university, it's actually, um, I'm really lucky to have found that course because um, my lecturers at RMIT really supported me and helped me thrive there, but also really genuinely like my point of view. And because I come from such a different perspective than the other students, when we have class discussions about each other's artworks and about the world, um, that I do come from this other perspective and that's just as valuable as everybody else. Can we talk about your intelligence? You, you speak so eloquently, like it, you, 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 you've got great turn of phrase. We can, I, can, I can hear immediately that you're highly intelligent. Um, what was that? Because you said you got expelled twice, suspended seven times. Where did this learning come from? Like, where did you really bunker down and, and, and get this next level thinking? I actually don't believe in intelligence. Okay, please. Let's um, break into this. Yeah, I really, I, I feel like it's really holding the human race back, this idea of intelligence. And I think that, uh, you know, I look at the disability community and I think we're the most diverse community there there is. And we have so much to say. Um, however, the idea of intelligence, that's one big thing that is really holding our community back because we're not hearing from the perspectives of people with intellectual disabilities or Down syndrome um, or acquired brain injuries. Because they're not intelligent. Mm -hmm. uh, people, deaf people yeah. as well. Like deaf people are seen as unintelligent because they don't speak verbally or some do. But it's so true and it's not the case, is it? Yeah, no, um, they have a lot to give to society. And, and the other thing I think about is that when you have an idea um, and that idea doesn't get challenged, it's not often a very strong idea. But if your idea gets challenged by, say, the disability community with access needs is a really good example, that that idea becomes really strong and it then becomes universal design. It's strong enough to to hold everybody, almost everybody. So um, it's, you know, with the disability community comes a lot of creativity because you have to think, and I'm going to put a dollar in the jar. Okay. You've got to think outside of the box. Hey. Hang on, hang on. Where's the box? Ah, thank you. Very yeah, good. There you go. I'm a guy we're all playing. Um, <laughs> as Angus said, you are an incredible artist. Why do you love art so much? Um, well, art is just, I mean, I, I, because I had to learn how to mask my autism, it meant that I um, needed to find other ways of self-regulating that were socially acceptable. So what were some of the ways, if you were unmasked, what do you do to self-regulate your autism? Flap my hands, jump up and down, bang my head, um, uh, just spin around, really like sensory seeky, like just seeking out sensory input in a repetitive way, rocking back and forth, um, the, uh, patting carpet, you know, looking for textures. And, and, that, and that helps you regulate, so you feel yeah, better after that. So if an example is if you're really angry, then it feels really good to scream. Mm. Yeah. However, screaming is not a socially acceptable thing unless you start singing. And singing is a socially acceptable replacement of screaming. Ah, it's too. And so it's all, this is where I started Taekwondo and where I started art because with these disciplines, you have to repeat, repeat, repeat over and over again in a sensory way um, in order to get those skills up, get that muscle memory up. And um, so it does make me highly skilled to be able to find those sort of stimming replacements, but sometimes you know, I can't just practice Taekwondo all the time and I can't just, um, like I can do art all the time. <laughs> That's infinity. If you want to put Angus but in a chokehold, you can. It is really? <laughs> yeah, I reckon. <laughs> well, thanks can for offering me Can I get that up. in writing? Yeah. Well, Angus, will <laughs> you let Prue, will you let, will you let Prue 
Put I'd, you in a chokehold after this? I can teach you how to get out of a guillotine if you want. Wait. That seems like a great school to probably get into. Yeah. Okay. Uh, put him to sleep. Um, now, I'm, I'm just going to go. Go for it. There's a big present on the table. Who has brought a present? I've actually bought more than one present. So it's not, is it, I was hoping it was just me, but it, it's me and Angus. Is yeah. It? I get Angus present? gets as well. What did you, I mean, what did, how do you get a present for me? I mean, Dylan, you have a, you know, a, a relationship where you've under, you've been in circumstances. I've known him for one week. one week. I know, but still, it's still more back history than me. You've known me for one hour. <laughs> Uh, not really, because Dylan told me you're one of his best mates. Okay, okay. I right. did say that. Okay. I might have been putting a bit of mayonnaise or GST oh. on that. Thank you very much. Yeah, you put a bit of dollar in. Have you ever heard that saying? Putting mayo on it? Put a bit of mayonnaise on it. That's a, That's a, good a little bit of yeah. extra what, bit of, no, he is one of my best mates. What have we got? I'm ready. I'm ready no, for the presents. I need a translation first. Yeah, mayo. What's so the put, mayo? Um, like, putting a bit of extra lie on top of it. Let's say. Oh, on top of a story. You're yeah. lying to me? No. I was pretending. I, he is one of my best mates. I was just saying it to make him feel a bit bad, but he, he honestly is. Yeah. You were saying he was one of your best mates to make him feel bad. And then bad. I said a joke like, oh, maybe he's not, but he actually is. Look yeah. at him. Hey, look at him. He's a beautiful man. How, how do you say no to that face? He's not working. He's not explaining <laughs> that at all. So it's like, do you know, um, it's, putting a bit of, it's putting a white lie on a story to make it feel better. It's like, I found $5 on the street. And then that story's not good enough, so I found twenty dollars on the street. You know what I think would make him feel really good? Mm. What? If you genuinely told him that he's your best mate. He, Angus, you are genuinely one of my best mates. I very much enjoy our relationship and hanging out with you. There you go. Does that make you feel better? It makes me feel better. Yeah, good. I good. think that's so much better than mayo. Yeah, it's true. It's also like I tell you what, he's good though. Mayonnaise is delicious. Do you agree? Are you taking my water? I am touching your water, <laughs> and I'm a bit thirsty. Uh, you can have it if you no, want. No, that's yours. No. <laughs> Do you like mayonnaise though? Yeah. yeah, it's delicious. Thank you. Great. There you go. Um, so present time. Back to the presents. Woo! I'm excited. Apart from a couple of dollar coins, we I feel really unprepared. So I'm holding it. It's uh, wrapped up in brown paper. I want to be delicate with it. Oh, oh this is going to be so cool. Beautiful. Can you explain what it is for us, Prue, for the people that obviously can't see? So it's an embroidery work with, it's in an embroidery hoop and it is on purple cotton and with bright orange cotton, it says your neurotype is valid. I love that. Which I hand embroidered. You hand embroidered this. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Can I give you a hug? Yeah, sure. That's nice. Coming up. That's very nice. Thank you. No worries. Before we <laughs> let you go, we have a uh, thing. Dollar coin. We're not oh, actually holding yeah. it. Oh. Um, it's good. It's good, isn't it? I love that you're getting autism training while yeah, we go. Yeah. Hey, everybody is listening as well, <laughs> yeah, which is awesome. Now, we have something that we call the bowl of uncomfortable, where we ask people questions they might not normally get asked. Uh, you don't have to answer it, but uh, we'll do one each. So I'll go first. Um, do you regret? having autism and would you change it if you could? I think that with that question, I'll need to get asked the question again because I have, I think that I'll actually go on a wild tangent You can go here on, you can tangent up. And I'll forget the point. You tell me okay. when you need but, it again. Um, I, I feel like uh, if I was a kid in the 90s, I would definitely want to take it away. But um, being able to learn how to speak both neurotypical and autism has set me up well for um, being able to advocate for the autistic community. Um, and I'm in a very lucky generation where I am in the first generation of autistics to not be institutionalised and be able to access society um, diagnosed. So not able to immigrate to any other Western country, but I am able to advocate and be part of society today. And I, I have worked very hard for it, which is disappointing, but I also just love people and I love, um, I, I, I love being autistic and I'm actually really lucky in that my brain, I can feel my brain. So, um, my brain can, it gives me some symptoms like say my brain will shut down and I'll be um or I'll have a meltdown and 
that is just my brain saying I'm tired and I need a rest. A lot of other people don't get that so they don't know that they need to have a rest as much as I do. I also um, really am glad that um, you know I'm part of this community that is just highly skilled and highly um, aware you know hyper aware of the environment and um, that you know what we can achieve with support is just infinity it's just amazing so I um and I and I enjoy sensory seeking I just love sensory seeking apart from Dyson hand dryers what are you most frightened of um probably probably police officers interesting why is that um well, police aren't trained in autism and they don't really seem interested in getting trained in autism. Um, they, you know, that they have the right to, to grab people. And, um, when, like when I'm in the supermarket, for example, and I am too tired and my filters start coming down and I start behaving like my natural autistic self, I do get quite anxious because I look at that security guard over there and I go, mm, is he going to like, up he is this going to escalate really quickly? Because I'm in the fruit and veg section right now and I'm starting to stim. And I feel like my brain is just going to shut down and the other customers might notice this and try and comfort me. And because I am a small female, um, you know, people want to comfort me they don't see me as a threat which is really lucky but they um uh, unless they start thinking that I'm mentally disturbed um but that they often will try and comfort me with a hug or touching me and if I'm having sensory overload then them touching me lightly is going to cause me extreme pain it might feel like a knife cutting into my skin like mm. it can be because I get so hypersensitive and I could get, you know, flashbacks from primary school where I used to get cornered and have these behaviours that um, I've been punished for so many times that it can, and then the security gets called. For me, I know that the police most likely won't get called, um, but if I put myself in the position of an autistic man who is six foot three, mm -hmm. then the police would definitely get called and they could get touched. And you know, that the amount of autistic people that are in jail and probably don't want to leave because there's much more structure in jail, um, is huge. Mm. Yeah. Now, before you get out of here, I want to ask you, what is one bit of advice you would give to people that are listening with autism or even parents of kids with autism what's the one bit of advice you want to give remember to self-regulate and um to allow autistic people to self-regulate however they need as long as it's safe for them and safe for others so you know you can always find ways that it is safe to self-regulate and um and that's really important um can i give a second piece of advice you can give two only because i like you so the second piece of advice is that if an autistic person is um, past the point of return where their brain has shut down and they actually are not able to be rational, to just ride it out and wait until that's finished. And then um, once that's finished, you can start communicating with them again. Great. Great. You're so impressive. Really are. I'm really glad we met each other. Thank you so much for coming in. And I'm glad Thanks you guys met each other. So then I get to meet you. Thanks so much for the opportunity. And if anybody wants to get in touch with you, I know you're a great artist. You've got an awesome Instagram. You do great work with the maze. If anybody wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way to do it? Uh, well, I've got a website, prustevenson.com. And you can also, you can go to the contact page and that is linked to my email Stim your heart out at gmail.com. Stim your heart out. That's <laughs> Love awesome. That. Um, uh, it's been a great learning. It's been an incredible episode and uh, it's been just lovely to meet you. 
crew at the end of the day. So thank you so much for being Keep part of this. Keep being you mm. because you're advocating and helping a lot of people. Now, what are you going to do for this? What are you doing with all your money you've got? I'm going to give it to a maze. Okay, you are? great. Okay. Amazing. You know what? We're going to top it up with some more coins, all right? Yeah, you're going to have Are you ready? Just say, hey, bang them in. You can have all the dollar coins. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hey, Ooh. it's raining cats and dogs and coins. Oh. There you go. Thank you very much. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you for it. did that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs>